It's the Geeky Waffle Podcast. In honor of Spider-Man No Way Home coming out this month, we wanted to talk about a different Spider-Man production, Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark. Our special guest today is Rachel Leesman. Is that how you say your last name? It's Leishman. Leishman. I've never said your name out loud. I've only- Because it's normally like in a group. Yeah. (laughs) I was like, but yeah, Rachel actually saw this insanity in person. And I'm so excited to get like a firsthand experience about this. Because Turn Off the Dark is the most expensive and dangerous Broadway show ever. And as we found out, the behind the scenes is even more interesting than the show itself. Every so often, I was like DM Rachel. I was like, "This is crazy." <laughs> yeah, and it's th- half of it was like the more normal stuff that existed within the show. You're like, "Oh, this is crazy! This show is so expensive." I'm like, "Yeah, that's not even like the craziest part about the whole situation with <laughs> Spider Man turn off the dark." So, how did Spider Man swing into Broadway? A superhero musical wasn't quite new. It's a bird, it's a plane, it's Superman, played for three months on Broadway in 1966. It had positive reviews from critics, surprisingly, but the audiences just were like, meh. But like, Spider-Man has always been popular, right? Like, did you grow up with Love and Spider-Man? I did. Um, my brother is not the biggest Marvel fan. He's more DC. Mm-hmm. Um, but the one mo- the one big Marvel character that he loved was Spider-Man. So then when I came around... I ended up with the love. I like. I am the bigger Spider Man now. I think out of the two of us, but I like the first midnight premiere that was just me and my brother was the 2002 uh, Spider Man movie that Sam Raimi did. I went to every single like opening premiere of the Spider Man movies, I, the Spider Mans, um, <laughs> from like Toby through Gar- Andrew. I watched the cartoons. Like I was a huge Spider Man fan, which is why this musical. My mom was like, "Perfect, I'm gonna buy this for." I think it was my 16th birthday. My mom was like, "It was either that or like I did good in college. I can't remember what it was, but she was like, "I'm gonna get you like tickets to this," and that's why we <laughs> went turn off the dark <laughs> alone, mind you. No one was with me. I went by myself. Oh my god, <laughs> and that's dangerous too. I feel like you need a buddy to see this movie. <laughs> Oh, I'll explain it when we get into this show, but I did think I was going to die at one point while I was watching this show. And it is because of the history, but like also it was very dangerous where my seat was. And I was just like, I'm going to die watching a Spider-Man musical. That is not good. No. Oh my gosh. So yeah, I, I loved the animated show as a kid and the 2002 Sam Raimi movie was like the biggest blockbuster of the day. I remember mm-hmm. being hyped for it as a kid too. And going to the theater with my parents and just being like, yes. Because, I mean, the Batman movies had come out before. The Tim Burton ones were a little too scary for me when I was younger. But the campy ones, even as a young child, I was like, I don't know if this is cinema, you know? <laughs> like, uh, that Batman has nipples. I'm not sure about that. I'm confused. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure if I like that. So, like, Sam Raimi's Spider-Man, the first one, gro- mm-hmm. was the first film to gross $100 million in one weekend. So, of course, what happens when anything makes money is it's everywhere, right? <laughs> like, yeah. I remember, like, there was Spider-Man merch, early 2000s, everywhere, book bags, shirts, toys, lunch oh, yeah. boxes. Yeah, I mean, I probably owned a good majority. Like, I- I'm currently wearing a Midtown Science sweatshirt, and I have a Spider-Man tattoo with my Spider-Man purse. Like, I haven't changed. I turned 30 this year nothing strange but like (laughs) back then it was like I found recently like a folder that it was not Spider-Man adjacent but I had just written Tobey Maguire's name in it in Spider-Man colors (laughs) like it was like a craze of how much Spider-Man like how popular it became that's how me and my best friend first hung out was she was like do you want to come into my house and watch Spider-Man before the second one comes out because I had just moved to California and I was like yes and ever since we've been best friends so it's like bringing people together (laughs) yeah and it was like everywhere you turn there was something Spider-Man adjacent for a real long time yeah for those who weren't aware in the early 2000s because we do have some younger listeners um just imagine (laughs) the frozen phase what happened Mm -hmm. after frozen about it being everywhere that Halloween Spider-Man's everywhere (laughs) kind of thing so yeah. in 2002, Marvel announced that Tony Adams would produce a stage musical based on the Spider-Man comics, Bono and the Edge, 
based on the comics is like it's very real fast and loose it's not it's barely based in reality they made up a character they like, made up a bunch of characters for the the first version on the and sinister we, six though is what i'm thinking they just made Swiss up a character because they liked her de- design because like, there needed to be some feminine there needed to be a female in the sinister six so they no, made someone after you don't, coco you, you don't need to put a woman in the sinister six just leave that alone you could also could have added women in any other aspect yeah, you could have given uh, like Aunt May a little bit more to do if you really wanted to, yeah. you know. Or like you, I don't know, put Gwen in there too. Like yeah, it there's have plenty to of, be MJ. Felicia could have been in yeah, there. Felicia like, Day. Okay, so yeah, Bond of the Edge approached by Marvel. We'll go into them, and then Julie Taymor, who directed The Lion King, which is like one of the longest running Broadway shows. Mm-hmm. It toured all over the world and is a masterpiece. It's. I get chills sometimes just thinking about it, you know? He lives in you, lives in me, <laughs> kind of thing. <laughs> um, so this seems like, if not a great, but an interesting mix, right? Yeah. In theory. Um, in theory, yes. Let's go um, in theory. <laughs> yeah, in theory, because in actuality, you listen to that show and you're like, oh, Bono came up with one song and they were like, this is great. Can you do all the music? And he couldn't. And they just stopped it at the one song. So... Okay, this is, like, so sad. In 2005, oh, while no. they were signing the papers and the contracts to get this moving, Tony Adams, the main producer, the person who was holding it all together, had a stroke and died. You're so telling he- me that this is this man's rent? That this is, like, the show that, like, will hold it? Spider-Man no, he. But like, he didn't even start, though. But it's this is but how that started. But that's team. what happened with Jonathan Larson. Like he died before it ever went up. And but so, he like, write it though. So, like, still, this man's legacy is now that he was the producer of Spider-Man: so, Turn Off the Dark. He had a he had a producing partner. I forget his name, but like, he had like no experience. So he took over, <laughs> and he just gave like all control over to Tamor. And we'll find out that was a disaster because. <sighs> There was a spare no expense attitude. (laughs) And this included (sighs) overhauling this historic theater, the Foxworth Theater, with rigs and flying equipment. And just to put that in perspective, the last show that was done was Young Frankenstein. (laughs) So it's like to go from that to Spider-Man, where literally... They wanted people flying around doing action sequences. And it cost so much freaking money that the production was delayed so many times because they just didn't have money to pay people to work on the theater. It's crazy. It wasn't until <sighs> Disney bought Marvel in 2009 that there seemed to be any hope because you got the M- Mickey Mouse money now. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember hearing any of the drama before the show? Like as Before the show? Thing? Yeah, yeah, I remember hearing the. This was all prior to Julie Tamar being fired, correct? Yeah. Sorry, spoiler, spoiler alert. <laughs> spoiler alert. Julie Tamar gets fired. Um, I remember there being like. So I just saw when it actually first. Pre- I couldn't remember if it was twenty eleven or twenty. Um, like back when they announced it, that I saw it. Um, but I saw it in twenty eleven. So I. Uh, it was for sure a college thing that my mom was like, oh my God, here's a birthday gift for you. You're in college and this is what she gave me. Um, but she didn't know. She thought she was doing a good thing. She was like, you're, you like Oh my Spider-Man. God, imagine you did die during the production. <laughs> the guilt. The guilt. My mom would be like, I took her to see Spider-Man and she died. Also, that would be a perfect story for me. It's like, Rachel <laughs> Lee died watching a Spider-Man musical. She died um, doing what she loved. Yeah, she loved <laughs> doing what you want, watching spider-man um but i remember like bits and pieces like i remember the later news when it gets really like yeah. wild but i knew there were like artistic differences that had started before it yeah, heck premiered ups. yeah and it's like um because i knew julie tamor i was very young when the lion king hit broadway like that was my first broadway show i ever went to um and it had just opened and i think i was five or six yeah um but I knew Julie Taymor because of Across the Universe. So I was very excited because I love Across the Universe. And I was like, I've seen Lion King. I know what she can do with that. But like Across the Universe is cool. Like that'd be really fun for Spider-Man. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I knew she knew Bono because of Across the Universe. So I was like, this is going to work out fine. Yeah, they're friends. 
They'll work yeah, great together. He, he's saying that I am, he is, you are, he is. Uh, well, I can't think of the name. I am the walrus um, in Across the Universe. And it was great. And I was like, oh, these two can work together. This will work out. I was wrong. I admit that. <laughs> so many people were wrong, though, Rachel. All the investors. Oh, yeah, everyone was wrong. <laughs> everyone was wrong. <laughs> and it's like, you could have, this, in theory, Spider-Man as a musical makes sense because he's swinging. It's very lyrical. Like, you can make it work. Uh, a tragic hero in some ways. So like, Yeah, they had no one who knew how to make it work, though, on the team. <laughs> like, no one yeah. could figure it out. I was shocked to find that Evan Rachel Wood was originally cast as MJ and <laughs> Alan Cummings of the Green Goblin. They both would have been amazing, but they left the production in March 2010, I quote, because the show was delayed. I think they just used their brains and were like, let's get out of here. Let's yeah, go. you guys really dodged a bullet of I still walk up to the two people who played Peter Parker and the Green Goblin to this day because they're Broadway stars. They are currently in the same show. They're I walk up to now. them. Yeah, I walk up to them and I'm like, I reference that musical at least once a week in my articles. <laughs> and my editors maybe edit them out, but I reference it regardless. <laughs> and my my boss went with me to see Hades Town, and she was behind me and heard me say it to Reeve Carney. And she, he, she goes... Yeah, she really does. <laughs> she finds a way to reference Spider-Man to the dark at any given chance. <sighs> yeah, we'll go into how some Greek mythology is in this later, too. <laughs> yeah, they really... <laughs> it just took their career where it was going. Yeah. Someone knew that they were just going to be in Hades town. It's like, it's fine. They'll be they got a happy ending. They're yeah, they'll land of, on their feet. They, they're one of... The, oh, some of them didn't land on their feet, Rachel. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I'm so sorry to that person who didn't land on their feet, but in oh, theory, God. Reeve Carney and Patrick Page, they're fun. Yeah. They're doing great. Uh, uh, Cummings literally said he dodged a bullet in an interview later. He did, but... Okay, so it opened for previews in November 28, 2010, and it was a hot mess. It started 24 minutes before the scheduled time. If you've ever been to a Broadway show, usually they start, like, right on time because they more recently it's now they're they don't okay. uh you can expect at least like 10 minutes yeah but like not there. like not like half an hour though no this is a little long but um no, r n the new wave of broadway shows i suppose is how you could say it um like i went and saw girl from the north country not that long ago and we were sitting there waiting and i asked what time it was and my friend was like uh 207 so we have a couple of minutes like because we know oh, yeah. there's like they give you like a little cushion in case you're running late and now mm -hmm. with covid procedures it takes longer so it's like everything's way delayed but 24 minutes is still like wild yeah something was wrong and that's yeah. how you know you're oh. like it's been a half an hour something's not right do you know what was obviously wrong to all the audience members was that the set was missing pieces great the Actress who's played Arachne, we'll talk about her more. She was stuck above the audience for eight minutes during that performance. Um, <laughs> also, during the same day, she suffered a concussion because she was struck in the head by equipment while she was waiting in the wings. I'm sorry. I hope she's okay. She's okay. That. She's okay. <laughs> it's just imagining a girl dressed like a spider in the wings and something just comes smack Bam. her in the head. I can't. Um, uh. Another thing that happened during this performance was the crew literally had to catch a flying Spider-Man because he was just swinging and he couldn't stop and they had to like catch him. I wish I was there. This seems fun. Oh my just... God. So this had the longest preview period in Broadway history with 182 performances and critics literally bought their own tickets just to review it because critics don't usually review previews, right? No, we're not. Well, we in can theory. go in news. The the way that they've been doing it is like you'll go the week before it opens. Like I saw six the week before it opened, which was the week before COVID shut down the United States. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I saw one of the last preview performances, and then it was like, just kidding, don't review this show because we're not opening for another year now. Um, but like normally it's like the week of opening. Yeah. They'll have so yeah, so they it was felt like they were keeping it in previews just so they wouldn't get bad reviews. But the critics were like, there's been over a hundred of these. We're just going to go. 
Okay, let's get into some drama. More drama. (laughs) So when Tamor was approached by Marvel and Tony Adams, she's like, the only way she would take the job is if she could find a narrative that sparked her imagination. And it's like, isn't Spider-Man enough? And apparently, according to the BBC, that something was the Greek mythology of Arachne, a woman who beat Athena in a weaving contest and was transformed to a spider by the jealous goddess. Uh, Marvel's creative officer, Avi Arad, uh, objected to Arachne because she had nothing to do with Spider-Man and should it be a major character <laughs> about her show Spider-Man? Especially because there is a character that is similar to Arachne named Madam Web, and it's like, so why would you not just put Madam Web in there and Peter could make some joke about Arachne? Anyways, continue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I can guess like what your feelings about Arachne in the story are because there's two different versions. The first version... She's in it a bunch. She's in it so much. She actually ends up being the main foe because Green Goblin dies in the first act, in the first version. <laughs> I forgot about that. Yes. So then Arachne... It's also like Arachne is the reason that Spider-Man got bit by the spider. She chose him because he's obsessed with spiders and wrote a high school report about him. And she's like, that's hot. Because she's like in love with him too. Good. I'm glad. This Greek. Yeah. She God, literally kidnaps like, MJ on. and is like, be with me, Peter, or else I'll kill MJ. And it ends with him being like, I'll do whatever, you know, save MJ. And she's like, oh, I have a heart now. And he's like, oh, you really love MJ. And then that's it. We were really trying something with Arachne. Yeah. Like... I get it. You want to make it your own. But also, there are Spider-Man characters that you can use and make references to Arachne, and it's not Arachne. Like I said, Madam Web is a character that exists in the Spider-Man universe that you could just use. But instead, they did whatever weird shit that was that is still somewhat in the show. Yeah, visually, (laughs) it's kind of stunning. Like, when you see the weaving at the beginning... Because Peter ends up telling the story and you see Arachne and it's floating through the sky. And it's beautiful, but it just feels so out of place. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. And it's like, why is this kid obsessed with spiders? Yeah. Like, the whole thing with Peter Parker is that he's a genius. Like, he doesn't, you also don't have to make him into Greek mythology. Like, he's already a nerd. Yeah. Like, we, we, can, all, we can be separate nerds, <laughs> the science nerd and a Greek mythology nerd. Well, also, like, the whole thing about, like, Peter, and I think one of the reasons, like, Spider-Man is such a beloved story is he's an any kid. You know, he's every man. Mm -hmm. It's just, like, what happens with this normal kid who's given a great power and a great responsibility, you know? But instead he was chosen by (laughs) a spider. Yeah, and Arachne also takes, like, a lot of the focus between him and Uncle Ben away of, like, Ben being his inspiration and, Mm -hmm. you know, May too, like, why he's fighting crime. Because instead, Arachne's like, you got this power, you have to use it or else you'll be cursed. So he's, like, not given a choice. (laughs) And that's in both versions, too. When he gives up being Spider-Man, she comes to him in a dream. In the second version, when she's not, like, a foe and is like, you gotta be Spider-Man. And she's like, I'm gonna be Spider-Man now. (laughs) you you really don't like you that that didn't need to be in there they They also it we didn't need him not wanting to be spider-man in a spider-man the first spider-man story Mm -hmm. like in spider-man 2 it makes sense because we've been with him for like a couple hours you know from the first movie and the second movie we see him reaching that point but literally he only becomes spider-man at the end of act one and then act two really he's like i'm done with this i'm tired it's like, we've seen you be Spider-Man for 10 minutes, Spider-Man. <laughs> He's like, no, you know what? I'm good. I don't need to be Spider-Man. It's like, like you said, like, I think every single version of the Spider-Man, like, trilogies that we've had. Sorry, Andrew Garfield, you were going to be a trilogy. Um, the second one was where he kind of battled with, like, not wanting to really be Spider-Man anymore. And it, like, made sense because, like you said, We've been with him for a while. And we know Um, he's been through it for years at that point. Yeah. And even with Tom Holland's, it wasn't that he didn't want to be Spider-Man. It was, I want to be a kid for a minute. Like, I'm going to leave. Yeah, it was just temporarily. He's like, I just want a break. I just saw, like, like my father figure die. I was part of this major battle. I am 17 years old. 
I what did this show? They're face. like, he's like, ah, you know what? I tried the thing. It's not for me. Um, I'm not going to be Spider-Man anymore, even though there's a super villain that has taken over New there York. There were six of them. On, the, on my first kind of outing as Spider-Man, I'm good, though. Like, he, he can figure it out. You're like, what? Why? Why have you decided this? It makes no sense. And it made no sense to a lot of people, which was one of the issues the audience had with it. So they kept closing and opening with previews because they would rework things and they're like, oh, just we have some creative conundrums and stuff like that. They tried to use all this jargon. But Tamer said, if Arachne's out, then I'm out. Uh, bye. Yes. Bye. bye. <laughs> See you. So like uh, Tamer was fired in 2011 following like all the horrible reviews. Um, she sued the producers in late 2011, saying they violated her creative rights and owed her money for her work on the musical. They settled outside of court. But, like, all this drama came out with, like, the um, with um, the court case and everything like that, including stuff with the, the music and Bono. Bono on the Edge, they didn't want to they didn't want to come to rehearsal to rework things when it was in the workshop stage. It literally was only workshopped for a very limited amount of time, which seems really weird when it's a whole brand new show, you know? Like, things are usually workshopped much longer. And according to the BBC, Bono and the Edge were so unfamiliar with Broadway musicals that the producers burned them an educational four-CD compilation of 60 songs from the last 60 years of musical theater, and they dismissed it, saying it was lame. Oh, I mean, like, it makes sense because you can listen. If you don't want to watch this musical, you can listen to the Broadway cast recording. And it sounds like Reeve Carney is just doing a Bono impression. It's like I that can't remember any of the songs. Thing sounds like I oh, literally like just Beanie's listened to company everything. Is in my head forever. Um, that one's the only like semi catchy one, and that no, wasn't until that wasn't created until the second one, I think, second version. I don't. I think you're. I think you're correct. But um, "Rise Above" is the song that I'm like Bono wrote that song, and they're like, "Great, can you do all the music?" And didn't think anything. They, they, they didn't think any further on the subject because like that is a good song that is a good spider-man song every other song sounds either the exact same or completely like not in the same show oh my god there's like a bullying number called bullying by the numbers oh that one and is it's, fun <laughs> it's just <laughs> peter getting picked on and it's so i can't by I flat can't. what's very weird is because they'll throw in spider-man references like flash thompson's in this show but it's like they say him every time he's in a scene, they're like, OK, Flash. All right, Flash. So you're like, yeah, I get it. That's Flash Thompson. Like, you're not telling me anything else about this character other than I'm supposed to know that that is Flash Thompson. And then he just like drives off and you never see him again throughout the entire rest of the show. <laughs> he like drives MJ to school and then that's it. No more Flash. Um. But it's just the music is like, I wanted to like it. I yeah, wanted to be like, this is a musical that I'm going to sing. And as you said, I could tell you three songs maybe and probably sing like a verse of them. And that's about it. Like I know when the world would end and it's when like MJ and Peter are sitting on this thing. Rise Above that happens like three times and then Freak Like Me needs company. DIY 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 world. Yes, that one is fun. I forgot that that existed. And then I, when I rewatched the musical, I was like, oh yeah, that song is good. <laughs> I was like, that is one good song. Oh, okay. So like in this version, Norman Osborn, there's no Harry, but he is married. And it's very <laughs> similar to um, Doc Ock in Spider-Man 2. His wife gets killed and he goes crazy. Yeah, and he's, like, doesn't talk. I mean, that is a common trait for Spider-Man villains is, like, their wife gets killed and they lose their mind. Um, it happened with Craven, Happens with Doc Ock. Happens with um, – I'm blanking. It happens with, like, three or four of them where their wife dies and they're like, I am now a villain. <laughs> um, and so, like, I'm like, okay, great. You're kind of combining that trope. That's fine. But the fact that he says in the show, are you upset we never had children – I'm like, you You do. His name's Harry Osborne. You just didn't, chose not to include him in this musical for whatever reason. Like, the reason that Harry or that Peter knows 
Norman Osborn is because of Harry. Yeah, and here they just have him win a contest, and during (laughs) the visit to the lab, he gets bit by the spider, and that's how he becomes Spider-Man. But yeah, Norman Osborn has a southern accent for some reason, and I don't know why. I can't find... A re- I looked online. There was like no explanation, just people mentioning it in their reviews. He didn't in the one that I had watched, but also, I did you watch Patrick Page? I think it was Patrick Page because maybe it's just Patrick Page's voice. Because Patrick Page's voice, like I'm like, oh yeah, it's Patrick Page. Like I never questioned it. So <laughs> like maybe it was technically more southern than like Norman Osborn would be, but I'm like, oh, this is Patrick Page, um, and I it was truly like a not like not a question in my brain because i think i question so many other things about this show that i'm like that's fine whatever um <laughs> you can be southern now. who cares uh nothing else makes sense so at least there's that uh but yeah like just choices just, choices, choices, yeah, being just made. choices. <laughs> okay so another choice that was made by one of the story writers glenn berger um at, the way the green goblin is killed is a piano falls on top of him and he admitted in a podcast that the reason he wanted that to happen was because he was fed up with George W. Bush. I was thinking of a way to do it without making him a martyr. So he just wanted to like drop a piano on George W. Bush. So he wrote it for Green Goblin. If that is makes any sense. No, that makes no, no sense. Wait, but how I don't I was the way to do it without making him a martyr. He's not a martyr in any version. In the 2002. He kills himself when trying to kill Peter. He's not a martyr. He like he ran trying the thing to kill into George himself. W. Bush without making him a martyr. But what does that have to do with? <laughs> I don't know. It's like I have this like long quote from his interview, and it makes no sense. That was the a great. Hold on, a piano. The green go. Sorry, I'm reading the quote. So yeah. the green goblin has a piano. Oh, yeah, cause he's playing the piano on the roof. That is still in the musical. Yeah. But he's trying, he's going to throw it down on the citizens of New York. Um, But the Green Goblin ends up below it. Yeah. What? What? Why? He says he wrote that scene and he thinks that's what got him the job. <laughs> this was their problem. You guys are trusting men to write this musical. And they're out here being like, I, I want to kill George W. Bush. And you're, I'm like, what does that have to do with the Green Goblin? <laughs> Nothing. Zero. You're just in, you're putting your anger with the world at large into a Spider-Man musical with no context. Okay. And just like a little fact. <laughs> okay. In the original version, Arachne has a musical number based around her stealing 50 pairs of shoes. Yeah. They're little spiders. <laughs> <laughs> they all dance. I'm acting it out. I, <laughs> I know. I wish this was all, video. <laughs> this one should have been video. It's also our faces every time we bring something up. Okay, yeah, so that's like it's like the best way I can describe it is if anyone has watched the SpongeBob musical. Um, the <laughs> in the SpongeBob musical, Squidward's legs. Imagine like fifteen spiders on stage. And they all, where I guess it's like the amount of spiders that would equal 80 pairs of shoes um, or 50 pairs of shoes. I'm not doing that math. Y'all figure it out. But so it's like eight legs of shoes. And then the number of spiders that would need to do that, that's how many are on stage. And then they're flipping their legs around and they're doing a little tap dance, (laughs) I think, or just a regular dance uh, about the shoes in a Spider-Man musical, because that is what people who like Spider-Man expect to go to Broadway is whatever many number of spiders dancing around on stage in shoes because Arachne, the Greek myth, stole some shoes. Me as a Spider-Man fan, that's exactly what I expect. Okay, I, I was just doing the math in my head and I confirmed it. That would be 12.5 spiders. Okay, so that's how many are on <laughs> they stage. They didn't even do the math right. They didn't even do the math right. The cover. The right about his legs. I wish like one there was like a half a spider. <laughs> She's like, <laughs> like I had an accident. I was one, in the like... Spider-Man musical. That's what happened to me. <sighs> but it, it, yeah, I've seen that one. Um, because every time I tweet about it, someone's like, "Have you seen that?" Like they uh, they want to know which version that I liked, which version that I see. Um, 
and I for I have blocked out those other versions because I did not see them um, out of my mind. So I'm just like, oh no, it's the only one I saw, which it was still not great. But <laughs> like, yeah, the rework second version got a slightly better reviews. Not like that, yeah, and great that's what I reviews, saw. But like, okay, so tell us about your experience. You said that you <laughs> nearly died, or you felt like you were gonna die watching this. Yes. So I saw it in either the fall of 2021 or not 2021. Could you imagine uh, the <laughs> fall of 2011 or the spring of 2012? The original cast was still there. I'm not sure on the exact date. Um, I probably still have my playable. I should have looked when I was at home. But um, the it, it was one of those two times because uh, it was cold. And I went and was so excited uh, to see this show. I went by myself. I love TV Caprero, who played Arachne uh, because of Across the Universe. So I was like, you know what? I don't even mind Arachne because I love TV Caprero. I go <laughs> to this theater and my mom worked for like a company and they got really good seats. And so I was in the orchestra, like a couple rows from the front. And I was so excited. And at one point, the Green Goblin and Peter are fighting each other and the like, the Green Goblin's hoverboard was above me and he literally like dropped down and I was underneath it. And I was like, I'm going to, the Green Goblin's about to follow me and I'm about to die because it was like, you could hear the hydraulics and I went whoosh. And I was just like, he's going to follow me. And I like screamed. And the guy beside me was like, you're okay. It didn't fall. Like, it was like very clear (laughs) that the entire section was like, oh my God, like that's scary. Not in the sense of like, it's supposed to be scary in the yeah, show, it's which part of the show, which I guess it t- kind of is because it's like, oh, it's the Green Goblin. But with the history of this show, especially, yeah. it's like, no, I'm going to die. Not like, oh, no, the Green Goblin is coming to get me. It's like, no, I'm going to die because multiple people have died while trying to make the Spider-Man musical exist. Technically, um, no one has died, but they've been horribly injured. OK, I thought the one guy had died. The one Spider-Man. OK, Um no, he okay. let me get my notes out about that guy. <laughs> Sorry, we have to clarify if someone died making this musical or was just horribly maimed while making a Spider-Man musical. That's what's that is what I think is the craziest part about this show is just like not that it exists, but that multiple people were injured during this. Were so injured dur- doing this show, and they said it's fine, keep going. Okay, so Christopher Turney was one of the Spider-Man um, stunt guys because it's not mm-hmm. always, obviously, the main Peter Parker doing yeah. the stunts. So there's a point where he jumps off the building and his harness wasn't harnessed right. And he just fell. Mm-hmm. And he was hospitalized. He, uh, see here, he free-falled onto the stage into the orchestra pit. He was like, he had ribs, wrists, a skull fracture, everything. It was like, OSHA also like, su- like fined them thousands of dollars constantly because of things that happened with the Arachne actress and other things too. Yeah, that I think he's the one that I thought had died because I remember that was like the first big one. Yeah, no, he just, he was just hospitalized for a while. Another Daniel Curry, who was playing a villain, also a Spider-Man stunt double, was pinned under a piece of equipment and suffered leg trauma. And like these like this musical is staying with people for the rest of their lives, injury wise, oh, you know, like they're yeah. probably going to ache when it rains and they're going to be like that damn Spider-Man musical. <laughs> Spider-Man. Like they, the, every time they see anything Spider-Man, they're like, they're like I yeah, hate like, Spider-Man. It's so bad. Oh, it's just. Like, I want, like, I obviously am a bad judge because I liked it because I'm like, I love Spider-Man. I was so happy to be, like, seeing Spider-Man swing around. But I, I, as I told you before we even started, like, I could see the Spider-Man in the wings when I was sitting in my seat. Like, because the way they did it, why there's so many Spider-Man stunt doubles is because, like, he'll swing back and forth across the stage. He swings up into the balcony and he swings all over the theater. But when you're sitting like off to the side you can see where all of them are hiding essentially to go swing across yeah and so there's like at least like 10 spider-men at any given time and the only time i think that it's like actually the broadway like stars of it 
are there like two moments where like one, like he swings up from the stage at the end of the show where he's like, I'm Spider-Man. And then he like swings up and then comes back down. And then they do the like Spider-Man kiss from the first Spider-Man movie. And he like comes down for curtain call. Yeah. And there is that, I think, dancing on the ceiling or swinging on the ceiling, which bouncing off the walls. Bounce, bounce, yeah, that one, which I was very impressed. Like he was able to sing a full song while on a harness moving all around. Like I have to give props to these people. Yeah. Like working in these impossible conditions. It is um, not an easy show to do. That doesn't make it a good show. It's yeah. just not easy. Uh, Green Goblin looks like he has like 40 pounds of costume on. And all uh, that yeah, makeup. It's all metal. Yeah. It looks like weighing him down. But he still got through all of that too. And I was very impressed. I have to give them props. I have to give them so many props for that. So yeah, I think this would have been better if they did it like at a circus or way type, uh, like, uh, type theater. Or... Well, that theater then house Circus Ole. I think the next now show... No, I think the next show that was in the same theater as Spider-Man was like the Cirque du Soleil show. They well, they might as came. well have been all rigged up. Yeah, I think that was like the next show that went in. I think now, if I remember correctly, that is the same theater that houses Harry Potter and the Cursed Child, I think now. Um, or it's like next to it. I can't remember which one I actually went into. But like, yeah, like the, I think the next show that was in that theater was a Cirque du Soleil show. <laughs> Because it's like, well, that's essentially you rigged a theater that wasn't built that way to do those things, but then also didn't hire Cirque du Soleil performers, which would maybe have been like the smart thing to do. Yeah. And you're right. It's Harry Potter and the Cursed Child now. So I've actually been in that theater and it's gorgeous. Oh, Um, yeah. It's incredible. That theater, like it changed that theater forever. So then everyone was like, oh, we can do these bigger shows here because what Spider-Man did. So I guess the good thing about Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark is that it changed the Lyric Theater to be, um, like, a way more accessible for bigger shows. Yeah, and I can say a lot about Cursed Child. I hate the script, but seeing it live, it was amazing. It was so well done with the visual effects. Oh, yeah, and, like, Uh, they have the... Sorry to spoil parts of Cursed Child, but they have Dementors at one point that fly around the theater. They're not actors. mm -hmm. They're, like, puppets. Puppets. But... The rigging system that exists in that theater made it possible that these puppets could fly all around the theater. And again, thanks to Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark. But it's really at a at what cost? Yeah, because <laughs> oh my oh yeah, let's talk about the cost. Speaking of which, okay, <laughs> so even with all this drama, the theater would still sell out. Would you say that the show that you saw the day you saw it, the, the theater was full? Um, I mean, it's been 10 years, but I would say it was pretty and it, it was a matinee because I was in college. So I like was in New York visiting. So it's like I could just go to matinees. Yeah. But you would remember if there was barely anyone there. That would Yeah, there was like a more. pretty good amount of people at this theater, at least during a matinee in like the middle of whenever I went. Yeah. OK, so yeah, so it's still sell out. And that was amazing. It actually has a record for the biggest week, which was two point million dollars. However... At the end, the producers couldn't get injury insurance anymore. (laughs) They had that lawsuit with Julie Tamer, which we don't know exactly how much she got in the end, but I'm guessing it was some bank. Um, It cost Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark $79 million to work, and it's the most expensive Broadway show ever. And if we compare that with the second most expensive Broadway show, which is Shrek the Musical, at $27.6 million. And that's the most expensive. Second most expensive. That's just. That's that 50 is more million dollars. Wild. Like, um, hold on. I want to look up something. Because okay. Moulin Rouge, the musical, is expensive. Because. Wait, so The Lion King was 27.5. Beauty and the Beast is 17.4. Wicked is 16.9. Okay. And let's use Tarzan as an example because Tarzan actually swung around the, the stage a yeah. little bit. That was only $16 million. Well, I would say, okay, you could compare Turn Off the Dark to um, like uh, what I just briefly Googled. So this is maybe not correct. <laughs> to bring Moulin Rouge to Broadway cost $28 million. Yeah. Um, and 
that makes sense because that stage is very huge and they have to pay rights every so that shows tickets are expensive because they're paying for rights for all these established broadway actors too like yeah not that the spider-man cast wasn't they weren't as big as like aaron and karen for Moulin Rouge. Well, Jen was, but Jen was like the only one because okay. Jen Jennifer Damiano New Normal became right? famous in the next to normal came next to normal became yeah. famous in the same show that Aaron DeVate did. Um and she was nominated for a Tony and stuff. So this was like a big deal at that time because this was like two years after Next to Normal. So everyone was like, oh my God, like this is her next thing. Um and she chose to play Mary Jane. Um but like when you compare like a show like Moulin Rouge, which does have like obviously not the same amount of stunt work but like Satine does come down on the swing that like exists from the movie and like there are people up and all these things so they have to also have uh injury insurance that's probably pretty high i would say yeah um still comparatively it is wild that spider-man turn off the dark costs that much money when a musical that like has to pay rights for all of these songs, because if, if you guys don't know, like Moulin Rouge jukebox has musical. like it's a jukebox musical and has like two original songs and everything else that they changed from the movie is like very popular music in today's world, like Katy Perry and stuff like that. So it is wild that that show costs so much less than Spider Man Turn Off the Dark, which was an original show. Okay, so it costs. To just run the show for a week, a million dollars. So a million dollars per week. And it's estimated the show would have to sell out for seven years to make all its money back. Do you think it could have last seven years? Well, I don't think Disney would have let it. Especially because Disney finally had control over Spider-Man. Yes. Um, Because, well, kind of. Um, they're still Someone, sharing Someone him, only but... had, like, the... The movie rights to it so yes and so but now that like now that the movie rights are kind of split between the two in a way yeah i think disney would have nixed it so that they could use him because when you think about it he appeared andrew garfield's movie came out not that long after this premiere or this opened and then tom holland five years later premiered as like five years after this show opened, Tom Holland was premiering in Civil War as Peter Parker. Yeah. So like, there's no way I think that Disney would have let it go on. And I also think Sony might have been like, "Hey, we're gonna nix this when they got the when they started doing the Andrew Garfield ones." Yeah, because, because they also started it. This is but this is a joke. This is a giant joke. And like SNL had multiple skits about this. They had oh, one yeah. where it was like a lawsuit hotline. Like if you were an audience member, you got injured. Sandberg played like a Bono looking character. And it was like, my reputation. He tried it. He did a really bad accent, you know. Like, yeah, Andy Sandberg doing any accent is bad. So like that that's delightful. <laughs> yeah, he he's, I love him. Even Sesame Street mocked it. And it was Grover being spider monster. And Grover falls into an audience member and says sorry this is only like our 17th opening night grover's got jokes grover they are making fun of it and oh there was even a law and order criminal intent uh, intent episode that concerned a high-flying broadway musical named icarus where actor actually died in the episode and there was a rock star composer and a high-strung director and you know straight from the headlines kind of thing and I also like an unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, <laughs> Titus auditions for Spider-Man, Too Many Spider-Mans, <laughs> the musical. I, I do remember that one. And one of the newscaster goes, actors were injured by Spider-Man's greatest foe, gravity in the ground. <laughs> well, and it's like, and I sent you a picture that Timothy Chalamet went as a Spider-Man on, from on Broadway. Yeah, he put a, he's but- injured and he puts a sign. Is on Broadway and he's dressed like Spider-Man with like crutches and a neck brace and stuff. Like it's, Yeah, I think it could have hurt the Spider-Man brand if it wasn't so big. Yeah. I feel like if you would have done this with uh I, I I don't know, I guess Iron Man prior to 2008, um, I don't think anyone would want to touch an Iron Man movie. Yeah. Well, I mean, 
we record we're recording this before Hawkeye, but we're getting a taste of Rogers the musical in the Hawkeye series, and I'm so excited about that. I'm really hoping they make some Spider Man into the Dark, uh, turn off the dark references oh, in it. I want nothing more in this world than into the Spider Verse two to have some kind of reference to the fact that like a Broadway Spider Man show existed because they reference so many things that I'm like. You have to like just put Reeve Carney in this thing in some way. They cut it actually. There was a joke where Spider Man Peter Parker B Peter B Parker says something like, "Oh, Bono made a musical about us in my universe." Why would you cut it? Why would you? They cut said it was like the basic or something. No, I want you to put it back. Put it back in there. Put it back in. Put it back in now. <laughs> Give me the director's cut. Put it back in there so that I can have the fact that there was a Spider Man turn off the dark reference in spider-man into the spider-verse because it's like it's one of those shows where like i i made a joke in an article one time where i was like oh when the green goblin brings in the sinister six and someone was like that's not what that that's not how that happens doc ock does i'm like no 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 no. in the canon of spider-man turn off the dark it is the green goblin who creates the sinister six and this guy fought me and and then finally someone was like there is a video that proves that she is correct that it was i'm like I'm not making it up. They just were like, oh, why keep the Sinister Six in any way, shape, or form like we know them? What if we just made up characters? Norman Osborn brings them in because why have one where you can have six is what he says. And also, um, they're, they're his employees. He mutates. They don't have origin yeah. stories. Yeah. Like, you know. But then he still gives them origin stories. Like, he's like Cletus Cassidy. Like, when you watch the Letterman one especially, but in the show, it's not – it's so weird because when you watch the the Letterman performance, he explains all of their backstories because he's like Craven the Hunter is he says he's a game hunter. Like he essentially says what we know about Craven the Hunter, and he goes and some say he likes the animals a bit too much. So like yeah. oh. insinuating that he's into bestiality, and then he goes Cletus Cassidy killed his grandma and drowned her dog or whatever. Um, and he says, my kind of guy, it's carnage. And like, he explains everyone's stories. Like, and then you go into the musical and it's just like, it's the lizard. And you're like, who is Dr. Kurt Connors who lost an arm? Which, why did you just cut out the entire origin story of the lizard? And we did allude to the Swiss Miss, which is oh a character who's like a Swiss army knife it was, that isn't in the comics. It's unnecessary. No, it's a cool design. And that's it. It was yeah. someone in that costume department was like, ooh, what if we made, like, a Swiss Army knife character? And Julie Tamer probably was like, yes. And then when they brought it on, they're like, we don't have enough money to switch it to Doc Ock. Okay, well, fine. Uh, Swiss Miss can be a part of the thing. Like, that's what it felt like because there's no yeah. backstory. There's, like, nothing to it. And it's supposed it's to be, like, a like- biological thing, and it's weird that it's, like, metal. It's just – it's a very weird – well, yeah, because – but it's also weird because they already have Electro. Like, they were like, it's Electro, and he has, like, little things coming out, and or, like, sparks. And then they're like, what if we get this this girl named Swiss Miss who looks almost identical to Electro? <laughs> we're like, okay. Yeah, it's just – it's hard. It's, it's hard to do that when there's so many – just, like, there's a plethora of Spider-Man characters that – and they have access to everything. Oh, you could have so easily, like, if you didn't really want to explain anything and you just wanted to introduce an idea of the Sinister Six. The Sinister Six, uh, if I might be wrong, but I think like the first incarnation of the Sinister Six are like Vulture, Mysterio, Lizard, Green Goblin, Doc Ock, and Electro are like the first, like, or like the main group or whatever. Yeah. Then you go on, you can, there's like Craven's part of them. It's like they have, there's so many different versions of the Sinister Six, but like essentially what we're getting in No Way Home is the the original Sinister Six because we've already had Mysterio show up. Vulture's already been there. Like they've all been there and now they're bringing in Doc Ock and stuff. Um, But what's weird is like, okay, so say like, uh, but I'm trying to think, they used the characters that were coming up in the Andrew Garfield movies. Why so not? So I was like, why not put the vulture in there? He flies. You got a rig. You would think, but uh, I, maybe because the vulture's not that cool. Like, so 
what worked Michael with Keaton the Disney Mar- yeah, but what worked with the Disney Marvel movies that I think Sony didn't think was going to work is like they're like, oh, you can have these villains, and Disney went okay, and they made them cool and made them work. So yeah. like now in retrospect, we're like, oh, it would have been so cool to see Vulture True. and Mysterio. They, yeah, Mysterio. But back then, yeah. you'd be like, who is this guy? I don't want to see. Like if you're just a casual Spider Man fan, you're like, I don't really mm-hmm. want to see that. But like. Yeah. diehard spider-man fans would have been like oh that's cool that's like the legit sinister six but like even like as a kid in the the animated series vulture and mysterio weren't that cool you know yeah that's what i mean they, but like, they were was. jokes they were more joke um but yeah but yeah vulture would have made sense because they had the rigs and he could fly um doc ock with those rigs also would have been pretty cool yeah but like I, t- I was talking to you before and i was like so have you ever you've been to disneyland right yes have you- Oh, wait, so they have a theater there that they do like pre-Broadway shows. And I saw their Frozen version and they rigged them up to look like they were falling out of the a sled and everything like that. And I was like, how is it possible Disney puts on the show four, four or five times a day and it's a thousand times better than this like Broadway show? Well, it's because... Like, shows going through a bunch of revisions before they open isn't unheard of. Like, my favorite one that I've recently watched do that was American Psycho the Musical. Um, Because in American Psycho the book, there's this weird rat storyline that's not, like, it's disgusting. It makes sense in the book to, like, show his, like, mental state and stuff. But, like, I absolutely hate it. The movie does not touch it, which I was like, thank you, Mary Heron. She said, I'm not touching this. The Broadway show tried. And mm. I watched from like the first preview where they were like trying it to like, oh, we're going to slightly reference it. And then we're just not talking about it at all anymore. Like I watched how they've like slowly cut things or how characters changed. And like, uh, oh my God, well, I can't think of his name. Uh, Patrick. B- B- no, no, no. The a, a Broadway performer who is, uh, he was an American Idiot, the musical. And then he was an American Psycho. But isn't Matt Smith playing? Matt Smith was in the London one. In London version. So I didn't see the London version, so I don't know. Theo Stockman, sorry. So Theo Stockman's character was one of, like, Patrick's earlier victims, and then he died. But then, mm-hmm. like, in the in a later version of the show, he's in the whole thing because he's his friend. Like, stuff like that isn't uncommon. Yeah. But the way that Spider-Man <laughs> turned off the dark completely changed so many times is, like, unheard of. Yeah, we didn't even bring up, like, in the first version, there's a – Greek cores, which is really a geek cores, uh-huh. who are in class, who are writing uh-huh. the Spider-Man story that you're watching. And yeah. th- they just, they cut five cast members, five characters out of it in the second version. Like, that's unheard of to, like, cut that many people and that much of a plot. Or just not, like, cha- like, what's wild to me about this entire show is just, like, they switched it to essentially be the Sam Raimi movie. Like Pretty much, yeah re-watching it like I remember when I was sitting there I was mad about the switches because I'm like you're switching this movie around and it doesn't make sense how you're switching it around like I was like Harry's not in here this like and I was like I remember like sitting there being like why did you change that like you could have just made that movie a musical if that's what you were gonna do um but like it, it, I, I it's just a really big question of like who was this for because it wasn't for comic fans because like we I'm know sitting here, hints. yeah. <laughs> like, what? yeah. I was like, and I'm sitting here picking it apart. Like, that's not in the comics. Why did you do this? Why did you add a character? It wasn't for Broadway fans. I'm like, did the you just want to capitalize? There. Yeah, I was like, did you want to capitalize on the name Spider Man, and then not put in any effort <laughs> to make it a Spider Man story? What it outside seems of, like, like what you want? is there were a lot of egos, maybe a lot of hubris. Uh huh. That was a downfall. And um, I think they needed a strong producer there because Julie Tamor does excellent work. This just seemed like you you need that like guiding hand. Yeah. And I think Julie Tamor does you need well sh- when she has yeah. like uh, why across the universe works in my opinion is because it is. You have the music of something, but it, you're telling a completely different story that has nothing to do with why the music was written. And I think she wanted to just, like, tell a story about, the like, Arachne, essentially. And was like, oh, but if we use Spider-Man, we can get, like, a bunch of money and, like, 
fans come, and I'm like, no, 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 you don't understand the How cultural crazy significance. Yeah. Yeah. And the cultural significance of Spider Man in that case, if you're like, oh, I'm just going to use the Spider Man name, but tell the story I want, it's like, that's not the same thing as using like the music of someone and do it like, if you wanted to use the music of U2 and tell a story about Arachne, I feel like you could have done that and that would have been fine and not had people like horribly maimed because of your show. But you were like, instead, I want to do a Spider-Man musical so that people will come and see it thinking it's about Spider-Man. And it just like trickled down into spending hundreds of millions of dollars throughout the years making a show that was like, in its final form, subpar at best. Like, and that's coming for me. Like, I could watch anything to do with Spider Man. And I'm like, great, it's more Spider Man. I don't care. Yeah. And, and I was just like, it's fine. And I like, I heard like some people were thinking that like the reason they didn't want to make changes was because they thought it was like the technical issues were the real issues. And that if they just figured, you know, the harness is out and stuff like that, it would be fine. And it is scary making changes when. It's such a big budget, but it's they needed someone who could say no to them, who could say, this is our budget. We can't go over somebody who was better at managing money than the producer they had. Someone who wasn't intimidated by these big name people like Bono and Julie Tamar. And they just didn't have that. And when you get these big personalities and these big creatives and they think they can do whatever they want, they do whatever they want. (laughs) And they really needed someone to, like, like you said, like someone needed to look at Bono and be like, you made one song. Yeah. You need to come to workshops. You need to come to workshops because these lines aren't working. We need to rework them because I bet nobody felt comfortable changing freaking Bono's lines without him there. Like, well, and like th- the funniest part of this show that truly makes me laugh out loud is that like I rewatched it and the whole song Rise Above is because Uncle Ben says to him, like, you have to rise above. And in the middle of that song, he's like, like my Uncle Ben said, um, the and like says the iconic catchphrase. Instead, and I'm like, no, nah, he just said rise above. He didn't say he never great said power comes great responsibility. He said rise above. And he's like, my Uncle Ben said with great power. And you're like, no, he didn't. He didn't say it. And if he did, it was like offhanded because the one that like they highlight is when he says rise above. Yeah. And I'm and like, that's that's the whole thing is I think the story should have been more focused on Peter and his family and his friends mm-hmm. and his relationship with Uncle Ben and his just his desire to be a good person, but also want to le- live a normal life more than yeah. being gifted by the gods. Yeah, exactly. Because like, uh, this show is a series of like afterthoughts. Like yeah. Uncle Ben dies and MJ's there. I was like, why is MJ there? Yeah, or in one version, he gets run over by a carjacker. It has nothing to do with Peter. I think in the second version, he gets killed while Peter is um, getting the money for the car by fighting a guy in a ring. It's just like... Which yeah, is, like what, that is the one that is based off of the Raimi movie. Yeah, but it's not like Peter's not there or like... It just... Well, they cut out the weird middle part that is the important part of that scene, whereas like... Peter thinking he's doing the right thing by getting back at this guy. Yeah. Lets him get robbed. And the guy who leaves is like, thanks kid. And he runs away and then ends up killing uncle Ben. And that's when Peter is like, Oh my gosh, what have I done? And they cut out that section and just made it. Some guy hijacked the car and killed uncle Ben while Peter is trying to win money for a car. And he's like, no. And you're like, yeah, but you do. What lesson did you learn? Like you don't go anywhere. Like, yeah, yeah. It makes so, it, if you're trying to earn your own money, maybe don't. Yeah, um, so follow your parental figures around and guard them. I don't know what yeah. the story is, I, but yeah, yeah. I think but, we can safely say, even though we have not seen No Way Home, it's gonna be better than this. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if unless that movie introduces the Sinister Six with with a song. Yeah, William, Defoe, Defoe, oh, William like, Defoe just like 
Luna Dance. <laughs> All the weirdos in the world are here right now. In Just New imagine like, Tom City. Holland's like face and like he'd be like, "What is going on?" I'd be like, "This is the greatest day of my life." Granted, if that had happened, Tom Holland wouldn't have been able to keep that a secret because that's too big for him. Oh, no. Tom Holland would have for sure. He'd have been like, hi, I was a Broadway kid in case you forgot. I was yeah. very excited. <laughs> yes. Because Tom Billy Holland was, he was Billy Elliot. He's like, uh, I thought I could be Spider-Man in Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark. But I was Billy Elliot. Well, Rachel, thank you for going down this journey. It's a journey. It was a journey. Yeah, and we didn't even get into like 90% of the history. Like this is like the big things. But if you look up this show, you'll be in a rabbit hole for the rest of your life. So many. There's books. There are yeah, books there's on this. Books. Not book. There are books, books. on what yeah. happened. There are articles. There are exposés. There's documentaries on YouTube. <laughs> There are so much stuff that I tried to get through as much as I could. But every time I did, I was like, I am overwhelmed. You just kept messaging me being like, oh, my God. I'm like, yeah, yeah, you're not. Yeah, this is the major stuff. It's like when you get into it, you're like, why was this a thing that existed? It's like none of us know. It was just a couple of years of art, collective history that we all were like, remember Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark, a musical that existed. And we all followed along. Because people were getting hurt every night. Yeah, I just, I can't get over how long it actually ran. And the fact that it ran so long and it sold out consistently and still didn't make any money. They were going to like, at one point they were trying to just move it to to Las Vegas. Yeah, which makes just more like, sense. <laughs> and they have, it in Las Vegas. They have like, I feel like Las Vegas, one, you can get more space. You can get a bigger theater. They're theaters that are for big shows with actions and stunts and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And they could have made it into like a 90 minute show in Vegas and played it a few nights, a few times mm-hmm. a day. And it would have made bank. But now instead we have a podcast detailing the history of <laughs> Turn Off the Dark. Okay. Well, here's hoping Rogers the Musical is better than this. Woo! And then they bring Rogers the Musical to Broadway. <laughs> but then but we learned that someone has got seriously injured while making Rogers the Musical. I hope we just see Spider-Man swinging in the background. Or in the MCU, is just Spider-Man swings in the back. And he, like, can't get down. <laughs> he just He uh, takes down half the Avengers by accident. Oh, but yeah, and they're like, oh, no, the first previews started half an hour late, and Spider-Man took out half the Avengers. Great. That's what I want to happen in Rogers the Musical. <laughs> okay, Rachel, where can people find you online? Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Rachel Leishman, on Instagram at Rachel underscore Leishman. TikTok's the same handle. Um, you can read my work at the Mary Sue. I do some news writing for Collider. I'm writing features for your money geek with uh, lovely friends of uh, the podcast, uh, Arzu and Maggie. Uh, and yeah, that's about where I'm at on the internet. And yeah, Maggie has Starbucks lovers and Arzu has Space Waffles, both on the Geeky Waffle Network. Check out all our shows. We are the geekywaffle.com, geeky underscore waffle on Twitter. I am Candace is a geek on Twitter. And we hope you all stay away from flying Spider-Mans and stay geeky.